What's up, Discipline Investor? We got Benzinga CEO Jason Raznick here with us. The man, the myth, the legend, Tom Nash. Peter Schiff on the Power Hour with us live today. Interesting, different, unique, innovative companies. Mia, you are live with us on the Power Hour. What's up? Thank you so much for inviting me on. Jessica Billingley, that is the CEO of Aperna. The best trade idea resource out there. What up, what up? Welcome to the Power Hour, where we always find you ways to make money, and hopefully you are right now. Every day there's a trade, every day there's a trade, every day, every day. You prepare yourself when the market goes down like we have been. So today's a day where, um, you know, we got some down stocks, we got some up stocks just like normal, but you know, there's some people feeling the red. So we're here to help you navigate through that, and that's what I'm going to do is open my account right now. Uh, I think producer AB is out of town this week or just on vacay, I guess. But this is vacation to me. So this is vacation. So we're going to open up my account here. Um, we're basically flat today, but um, let's go. Let's go. So TAP up 18% since we bought it. That was uh, probably my biggest buy position I've made in a long, long time. Um, but we're going to pull that up in one second. Just hold on, guys, while I get the things going, because Luke Jacoby is not here, Zinger Nation. He is on a call with some people, and he asked me to fill in the 12 o'clock hour. So I'm excited. It's just me. And, uh, um, oh, we have a change in guess. Oh, so I thought VC prop uh, Properties is at 1230. Is that changed, Aaron Bree? Can you come on? Hey, Mr. Raznick, how are we doing? Good, how are you? It looks like your calendar, you have a mistake. He says 12 o'clock, uh, Ed, uh, Ed um, from BICI Properties. Yeah, I was trying to figure out with Zoltan exactly what time. Um, we told him we would do an intro and then bring Ed on at about, you know, 12, 10, 12, 15 or so. Then we Why? have another CEO. Why not 1230? At, we have another CEO at 1230. You guys can't be giving. Then when do I talk to them and share my portfolio and show them how I'm making money in these markets? When let's do, do I do that? Let's do it real quick. I can't do it real quick. It's it's hard work. It's hard work being out there trying to make a money and thing. It's hard work. Like this is not easy stuff. But all right. I mean, the company's sweet. So I may have accidentally, you know, <laughs> kicked them out of the room. Uh, we'll make amends. Wait, Raz, I never followed up with you after the draft. What did Oz end up with? On the CNBC draft, I'm, I don't know who that is. I'm, ha I'm hanging up with you. I don't know who the heck, what the heck you're talking about. Who's here? It's, okay, I don't know. I, should, people don't pronounce people's names wrong. I get, um, I get mad, so I, I had to kick him out. Okay, so let's let's spread the word. Okay, I don't know. Should let's spread the word. I get, that um, hit smash the like mad, button. So. Um, okay, so let's tell your go to social media. We got great companies coming on VICI, VICI in four minutes, then Green Power GP. Um, go to your uh social, spread the words. Um, so we have a couple of things we need to update you guys on, and um, let me just get that going. One second, let me while I put this thing on Spencer Israel. He made he made a mistake earlier, but he's getting better, so he's going to get that going right now. But we're going to start it up in just a minute. But yeah, I mean the the stocks that I have up today, you know, I told you are Molson's. I've been talking to you guys about that for a while. So um, you know, here's some of the earnings plays we have for this week. Um, no, that's for April 12th. Why is that even still here, Aaron Bree? Why is April 12th earnings play still here, Aaron? I don't know. I just deleted it off there, so it wasn't there anymore. I wasn't. But there's, but there's other old stuff in there. The the clean tech conference is no longer. So why don't we when we get that updated? Copy that. Get the new stuff. Okay. Um, all right. So um, I'm going to bring the guests on in a minute, but I'll do this one second.
Okay, Aaron, I'm, I'm glad that you were able to watch a thing, but you know, Peloton now down to eight, up a dollar today to 83. Earnings coming out. My sell at 96 and 102 look pretty good. Um, where I am where I am getting hurt is Leslie's earnings weren't as strong as I would have hoped. Although the HAY one did help, HAYW did help hold me over. But my Leslie's is now up only 15%. I was up 22% before. So that's my um, sad stuff through there. Um, you know, Leslie got cream. Yeah. So why did Leslie get cream with good earnings? I, I, I read the whole thing. Um, do you guys know? I I mean, I've been seeing this a lot with a couple different earnings. You know, companies that reported earnings, how they're good, and then they the stock tanks after they report good earnings. I don't get it. And we saw Pool did the opposite. Pool reported good earnings, and they here I'll pull up uh, Leslie's right here. I got Peloton pulled up. Wow, ten percent. Leslie's is down ten percent right now. Yep. That is a big move. Did you, so are you still in this or did you get out? Yeah, I like sort of some, but I'm still you, in it. So you trimmed, but your, your position is No, I, I, didn't, I mean, I had, I sold calls before. I mean, it was up so much, you know, um, just like my HAYW is up so much. Uh, I trimmed a little bit. I'll trim a little, fine. I'll sell a little more HAYW right now. Um, all right. Well, that's it. We'll, we'll go to my trades later, but I want to bring our guests on. They're way cooler than me. So let's just do that instead. Okay. So yes, send me the stuff in the chat, Aaron, because this is a special company and uh, Internet Enforcers is giving me feedback in real time on you every day. <laughs> every day I should read you the stuff. Okay. Yeah, um, I think that'd be, yeah, I think that'd be good. Constructive. All right. So that is, um, that's that. I'm going to bring on a, our guest right now. Um, I don't know what Rohan's doing. Rohan. All right. So, Edward, how are you? Very well. Jason, how are you today? Nice to meet you. Yeah. Where you, happy to where join you, the party. <laughs> where are you located? Uh, today I'm sitting in southern Rhode Island. Southern Rhode Island. I haven't been yeah. to Rhode Island too much. What, what am I missing out on? Uh, a beautiful place, a small okay. place. We're two and a half times, no, two and a half percent larger at low tide. Um, but yeah, fun place. Newport, Providence, very hip town, very great culinary town. Got it. Okay. Have you lived there all your life? Have you lived there? Beachy. Wait, it broke up. Have you lived there all your life? Oh, uh, no, no. I was, uh, I was born in Massachusetts, uh, lived in Worked in the New York area for many years, moved to British Columbia for 16 years, came back to New England about 10 years ago, and started Vici about four years ago. Ah, okay. And this company is not a small company. <laughs> no, it isn't. We started out kind of like smallish, and we got bigger really fast. Um, you know, we, we've done over a little over three and a half years Jason, we've done $12 billion of acquisitions. We've taken our market cap from what was $4 billion at emergence in the fall of 17 to today, if you account for our forward equity, uh, we're about a $20 billion market cap company uh, at enterprise value. Once we close on our latest acquisition, the Venetian, about $30 billion of, of enterprise value. So, yeah, we've gotten bigger fast. So how'd you, what were you doing before? Let's go back to your background. What were you doing before this? Before, uh, before, we, get to, before we get to your background, one of my, one of my friend want, friends wants to say hi. Do you know Joey Agri? Oh my gosh, Joey. When I grow up, I want to be like Joey. Yeah, don't we all? <laughs> yeah, he yeah is, he's doing an awesome job. When we tell people... You know, what we want to be able to achieve at Vici, we want to achieve the kind of value creation Joey has at Agri. 
Unbelievable. It's, it's unbelievable. I mean, I remember when Joey was, you know, Borders, Kmart, and uh, maybe it was Sears. I don't know. Borders, Kmart, and someone. And yeah. Because like, I was in high school then, and it's like, I mean, it's unbelievable, right? It's like he started the company from scratch almost. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, he's done an amazing job. Great vision, great execution. Um, really great. Now, are you, so are you a Detroit guy? Yeah. Yeah. I'm a Detroit guy. All I right. Work. I'm like kitty corner to him, like different neighborhood across the street. Oh, that's awesome. I grew up. Yeah. We grew up in the same, you know, schools and all that stuff. Well, and we've done a lot of business with Detroit guys. Uh, oh, right? have? Yeah. Well, we um, we bought all the gaming real estate oh, uh, associated with Dan Gilbert's uh, Jack portfolio. Oh, my God. I feel like such an idiot right now. So you're that guy. Yeah, we're that guy. So we bought the real estate of Greek Town in your town uh in partnership with Penn. do you know dan uh, i do not know dan uh personally no um okay. but the guys who ran the gaming business for him uh i've yep. become very fond of they're great guys and so yeah we bought greek town from dan with Penn as our partner we bought cincinnati from Dan with Hard Rock as our partner. And then in partnership with the Jack Gaming executives, especially Matt Cullen, um, I was, I was we, just bought, say that. we bought the real estate of Cleveland, uh, downtown Cleveland and Thistle, and they are crushing it right now with those two assets. So got a fond place in my heart for, uh, for Detroit. Stayed uh, when we were visiting with our partners. Stayed at uh, oh my god, what's that super cool hotel? They built? Shinola or Greek Town? Shinola. Is it the Shinola Hotel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or Foundation, but I don't no, know. No, I think it's a Shinola Hotel. Shin Shinola is amazing. Um, yeah, yeah. I was just in Cleveland for the Cavs game Friday night, and because I had my son's flag football tournament. And it was it was the it was the draft too. The NFL draft was there, so right. it was it was packed. I mean, it was it was packed. I mean, uh, you know the the drill over there. So so you're the guys, and then you did so you did the deal with Penn to buy Greek Town, and you know the the Barstool Sports guys were all just here in Detroit. You know when they launched their thing, and I I have Dave Portnoy on my um I have a show called the Raz Report. It's different than the Power Hour, and we've gone over all this stuff. It's crazy what's going on. I mean, I, like what's going on in this world. I mean, action. I mean, you, I don't know. Do you know Barstool? Yeah. And, you know, it's Barstool is representative of how fast the landscape is changing for American gaming. And if you allow me to just go off for a moment, I, I want to tell you why I think Penn's ownership of Barstool and Caesars engagement with ESPN and the NFL and everybody else is like fundamentally changing the way gaming relates to the culture we live in today, right? There's two great conversation topics in America, Jason. One is weather and the other is sports, right? And what gaming is figuring out through channels, media platforms like Barstool is a way to participate in the great American conversation about sports. And, um, it's going to fundamentally change gaming's opportunity to engage more people, especially younger people, especially Generation Barstool. And I think it's really powerful, really positive. And you've actually seen some news this week, Jason, in which, um, you know, Apollo's purchase of uh, the Verizon media platforms, AOL and Yahoo, is about, among other things, you know, capitalizing on the American appetite for sports and now the marriage of sports and sports betting, sports media and sports betting. A hundred percent. And you know, on top of that, Edward, like, I don't know if you saw it, two days ago, Action Network was sold for $240 million. Their content related to gambling, all it does is write articles about gambling. Okay. It's sold for $240 million. The, the revenue it did last year was, I think it was like 15, they hope, or they're going to do 20 million this year, 20, 20 million, no EBITDA, they sold for 240 million, okay? And so Benzinga, we get like 20 million people a month through our site, we have a you know, big audience, what have you, and we, we license content off of these platforms. But I wrote to, I wrote to our, my right-hand man, I'm like, 
Tomorrow we start our sports gambling content. So we have four articles going up like this more like today because it is insane. I mean, it is insane. You're, you're, you're right. What you what you described, it's a changed world. Yeah. And, and, the, and the, you know, in any given consumer sector, Jason, if you can have media do your marketing work, you have a way better business, right? So wait, say that, say, that, wait, say that statement again, that exact statement you if, just said. If you can have media, for if you're a consumer sector and you can have media do the work that's normally done by marketing, you have a way better business. In other words, NFL teams, they actually don't have to spend a whole lot of money on marketing because CBS, Fox, NBC, ESPN, and every other media channel that covers football does your marketing for you, right? You don't have to spend money. Oh, God, I got to buy billboards. I got to buy digital. I got to buy newspaper. I got to buy radio so that people will remember I'm here, right? Because that's in most consumer sectors, that's what you have to do. You have to constantly spend money to remind people, I'm here. I hope you'll buy my product or my experience, right? Well, once you get married into sports, guess what? The media is going to do your marketing for you, right? And so Penn, when it reaches the, the Barstool audience, it is acquiring reach and frequency that, that if they had to do it through conventional marketing, it would cost a bloody freaking fortune. And it wouldn't be very effective. And that's... And that's what Portnoy tells me. Like when he was here in Detroit, MGM is advertising like crazy, but you know, there's heart and soul with the personalities and the whole, yeah, exactly. So can we go back, like just take it back for a second and your background, like when you were like 15, what was your, what were your goals in life? I mean, uh, were you a golfer? Do you want to be a hockey player? Um, I already know some of the answers to some of this, but I just, I, I try not, I try to like play it like I don't know anything so that people who don't know anything about you can learn as well. Yeah, so uh, yeah, at 15, um, I was actually away at boarding school, not because my family had any money. I was on a scholarship because the high school in my town had kind of hit the skids. And uh, I was a very avid hockey player and a, a soccer and lacrosse player as well. And um, and I was, I was kind of small, but I had the advantage of being not that fast either. <laughs> I, I, I just really enjoyed those sports, but I also enjoyed learning. And then I went off to college, became an English major, and I did not have a plan, Jason. I just did not have a plan. The day I graduated from college, it was basically WTF. I don't have any idea what I'm gonna do now. I had, I had classmates who were signing up for interviews with investment banks, but I didn't even know what an investment bank was. Now, granted, this was a long goddamn time ago. I'm an old guy. Um, and But what I eventually did was I found my way into, apropos of our last topic, the media business. I got into the magazine business. Eventually, I became, after quite a few years, I became the editor of Ski Magazine, which, yes, was a lot of fun. Um, going to ski resorts uh, and getting paid to go to ski resorts was as much fun as it sounds. Um, eventually I got hired by a ski resort operations company called IntraWest. I'd moved my family from Upper Montclair, New Jersey in 1996 to Whistler, British Columbia, and became part of the team that was building Whistler Black Home and a bunch of other resorts across North America. Had tremendous fun for eight years doing that. Got hired to be a CEO of Hotel Reed in 2004. We managed the heck out of that for four years, produced 25% total return, uh, compounded four years in a row, sold the REIT to a pension fund in 2007, which turned out to be really fortunate timing. Board and advisory work, ran another hotel REIT, um, and then eventually was given the opportunity in 2017 to become the CEO of, of this new thing that was going to be a gaming REIT. Wait, before you go into that, IntraWest, so I knew that company. I, I but you, what was the role you started out there in? I started out in a very undefined role. Uh, I was hired by a brilliant man who ran resort operations 
And he said, I don't really know what you're going to do here. And it was 1996. So we came up because it was 1996 with a goofy title, Vice President of Idea and Product Acceleration. Yes, it was a stupid title. And yes, a friend of mine said to me when this new job was announced for me, you know, dude, with that title, you're going to be the first guy to get fired uh, when times get tough. But eventually... I, I turned that job into a larger job, building a team of operating and administrative specialists working across all our resorts to help figure out how to operate our businesses as, as best we possibly could. Um, and it was so much fun being in the ski business and it was so much fun working for the man I did who really taught me a lot about how when you're in experiential businesses like skiing or gaming, how every day is an opportunity to create a great experience, but every day you let go by where you didn't sell a great experience is a day gone forever. The inventory is totally perishable every single day. And so in my new category, gaming, that's what I love so much about the operators. When they you said, just get after it. When you say the inventory is perishable every day, so meaning like if that day it goes away, so like, doesn't that mean like if you're not sold out, you should lower your prices to sell it out or something for that day? Or does that well, mean the yeah, it wouldn't, that? it wouldn't necessarily mean that. I mean, there's there's a certain point in which it's not so much about price. It's about how many people are available to even have the experience that day. Okay. Um, but no, it's not so much about the experience going unsold per se. Like in the ski business, you might have sold a lift ticket, but did you create an opera ski experience that will cause these people not to go straight back to their cars, but to come to the patios, come to the decks, come to the operate bars and have, an, have a wonderful time closing out their ski day, right? Because yep. if you let them go straight to their car, that, that opportunity to create a great operate experience and generate the revenue that goes with it, gone forever. Yep, totally. And so you love the position you're, the business you're in now because these casino operators just get it. Like they, they, they focus on experience. So what, like you like the physical and digital experience, but you're a physical experience kind of guy because you're a REIT, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 The digital experience is going to really enhance our partners' businesses. It's enhancing Caesar's business, Penn's business, Hard Rock's business, Century's business. Uh, everybody we do business with. But yeah, ultimately we're about the place-based experience. And here's, here's what great place-based experience operators do. They manage the guest's experience of time and space, okay? And what the great operators do is they constantly challenge themselves and ask themselves, okay, for a given increment of time in the day or in the season, but let's just say in this case in the day, for given increment of time, is the guest experience as rich as it could be? Similarly, they look at a given space and they go, okay, is this space being used as productively as it could be to create a great experience? And thus it was gaming people who looked at the daylight hours as under-experienced time and the swimming pool as under-experienced space and created the day club, right? I think wind generates like 100 million a year out of its day club, right? I used to work in the hotel business and, you know, no disrespect to the great hotel companies like Hilton and Marriott and the rest, but I got to tell you, you could tie them up into chairs, blow pot smoke in their face all day. They would never come up with a day club concept, right? Because they don't have the imagination and the urgency around the perishability of inventory, whether in time or space, the gaming people do, right? It's just, it's a whole other way of envisioning experience. And there's, you know, you got to hand it to operators who have somehow have come up with an experience that enables them to charge people ten or twenty thousand dollars for a bottle of freaking vodka. Yeah, no, that part is, and that I mean, yeah, and then it goes away. Just like going to a, a basketball game, going to a Lakers game, you can you can charge five thousand a seat for front row, and I mean, you should you should come out to a Piston game. Check out Joey's seats, by the way. Um, I bet they're yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. So, so going back to um, th this, you know, you're you're acquiring things, Venetian, different properties. What do you guys look for when you make these deals? Like, what do your investors look for? How, how do you guys go about acquiring new properties? Yeah. So we start by 
we looking at the buggy. We start by looking at the market. Is it is it a geography we want, we want to be in? Right? Does it have the right demographic trends, the right social trends, uh, the right pop, um, the right economic trends? Once it's a market we know we want to be in, is this an asset that we want to own within this market? Right? Um, does it have good attributes as a real estate asset? Is it in a good location relative to its competitors? Um, is there a good curb appeal? Um, is there a good rival experience? Is there are fundamentally a good box, good bones in good shape um, and a layout that the operator can be successful in? Um, and then once we get past the market and the asset, it's a question of, okay, is this an operator we really wanna partner with? Do they have the operating expertise? Do they have the vision? And do they have the balance sheet that is gonna ensure they can be successful both as an operator and as a tenant who pays us rent. So that's what we look for. And then thus, you know, when we looked at the Venetian, Jason, we well, we were just freaking gobsmacked because this is one of the most economically productive assets in American commercial real estate. Not American gaming, American commercial real estate. In 2019, this asset produced $1.8 billion of revenue. We've done some work, we probably need to do more. We've done some work to try to determine, is there a single other asset in American commercial real estate that within its four walls generated 1.8 billion of revenue in 2019? We can't find one, right? It's 8 million square feet. It's the largest privately owned convention center in America. It's 7,000 plus rooms, the largest hotel in America. I mean, it's just the definition of incomparable. And we just got so lathered up at the opportunity to go after this thing. And yet we believe we bought it at it. Well, we bought it at a 40% dis discount. No, we bought it at 40% of replacement cost. Um, and we're buying it at a point when Vegas is going to start roaring back. Um, you might have heard Tom Reed say in his earnings call, Tom Reed, the CEO of Caesars, Caesar, Caesar. that... In the month of April that just concluded, Caesars ran 84% occupancy in Las Vegas. Jason, there's not another place in the world that ran 84% occupancy in April. Zip, zero, none, right? Anywhere in the world. And it's all part and parcel of Americans just being absolute batshit cabin fever crazy. They want to get out. They want to socialize. They want to have great entertainment and gaming experiences. And they're going to Las Vegas in numbers that no one's going anywhere else in the world. Yep. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's unbelievable. And the Venetian, I don't know why I'm echoing, but do you hear me echoing? Nope, not anymore. And the Venetian, those hotel rooms are the best on the strip. I mean, arguably, like I, I, I've stayed at the Wind. Venetian, Wind's beautiful. I like the electric blinds, all that. But the Venetian, those rooms are all large. And you feel like a, you feel like the president when you're there, honestly. Yeah, yeah. It's seven. It's basically seven thousand suites. I mean, it's yeah. It's it is. It is phenomenal. phenomenal. Yeah, phenomenal. It's still phenomenal. The test of time. That that hotel is the, because we throw events and we and we have some events in Vegas. And I know the hotels and you you know and it they it's just it's unbelievable that it's still still in you know, the test of time it, itself. So when you do that, so they so they become a tenant to you. And you guys, it's kind of like what Joey does for, you know, the real estate malls or, not, you know, whatever you guys do for hotels and gambling operators. Yeah. At this point, gaming operators. Yeah. So we're, we will be the landlord to, uh, to the operator. The operator, the operation has been bought by Apollo. Um, and they'll Got obviously it. preserve the, uh, the SANS team that runs the asset. Yep. And they've got a vision for the asset that, you know, is we think is going to be really successful. The other thing I ought to point out, Jason, um, is that in buying the Venetians real estate and the land that goes with it, we will own the land underneath the most exciting new arena to be built in the world uh, in the 21st century. And that is the MSG sphere. I don't know if you've heard much about it. I haven't. Um, so Madison Square Garden, um, which, you know, uh,
And people don't give a lot of credit to Madison Square Garden for being one of the first sports and entertainment related companies to see the potential of esports as a stadium experience, right? So Madison Square Garden, MSG as it's known, is building the MSG sphere on land uh, that goes with the Venetian. And they are spending $1.8 billion on an 18,000 seat arena that will be the new standard when it comes to uh, music and esports venues in the world. It's not being built for sports teams. Um, it's being built spatially and technologically to create a an auditory and visual experience that no other arena in the world can offer. There you go. That's it right there. It is going to be mind blowing. Really? And, and that, where is that? Um, wait, where is this going to be? It's it's on the back side, the, the the far east side of the Venetian parcel, right? There's a Venetian parcel, 88 acres. And if you, you've been there, Jason, so you know you yep. have the towers and yep. the Grand Canal shops out at the Strip. Then you have Sands Expo. Then you have MSG Sphere. This is, this is awesome. We I got we got to get get a trip out there with you. I'll get Joey. We'll get a trip out there. We got this thing. So when are they going to start building this thing? This thing's well, they have started building it. It's uh, oh. it's expected to be completed. I think either late twenty twenty two or early twenty twenty three. It's gonna it's going to be you know, and this this word gets thrown around too much. It's going to be revolutionary because there's no place else in the world like it today. Wow, wow. This is this. I mean, this is awesome. So how do you like being a public company CEO? I actually like it. Um, you know, I, I love it actually, because, you know, it's a, it's a structure in which we can move fast uh, when opportunity presents itself. So in other words, Jason, when we announced the Venetian deal uh, on Wednesday, March 3rd, we did what all Goodreads do, which is raise money either in advance of the announcement or most likely with the announcement. So that day, March 3rd, we knew we needed two odd billion of equity uh, to fund our acquisition of the Venetian. If we were a private equity firm or any other kind of private capital entity, we would have had to go on the road and spend weeks, if not months, coaxing people into giving us collectively $2 billion. As a public company, we raised $2 billion in one day to pay for the Venetian, hmm. right? So on that basis, in terms of access to capital, there's nothing that beats a public company. Now, the, the, the cost of being a public company is you have to deliver, right? And when you look at great and great CEOs like Joey Agri, they are willing to live with the challenge of being only as good as their last deal. Because your last deal defines what your cost of capital is going to be for your next deal. So as a public company, it's hard to hide mistakes. Don't screw up, especially as a REIT. You screw up as a REIT? Yeah, you screwed up once. And unfortunately, you only get to screw up once. Because now nobody's going to give you capital again. This is awesome. As an investor in your company, I would... Be that would be a reassuring hearing when you say that because you realize how important that is. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I also think you have, I don't know, your voice raspy or whatever. Like there's an app called Calm. I think they should make your voice one of the voices on the Calm meditation app. You got this like relaxing, calm voice. I don't know if that <laughs> helps get deals done, but I, one of my, one of our investors texted me that. He's like, I love this guy's voice. So I think you should, oh. they should put your voice in Calm. So, oh gosh, you know that you, another I career I, for you. Voiceover. What, what's the big deal? You know, you're doing this company. You, you can do some voiceover work, right? Yeah, but I think I think your investor needs to send that note to my wife because I think she would tell you. You know, would you just calm down a little? Um, That's good. Just, That's good. She That's is good. she is very serene and calm. I, by comparison, am somewhat. Are you? Up. Do you have Do you have kids? I do. I have two daughters, uh, thirty two and twenty nine. You, you uh, ever, go ahead. I was going to ask, did you ever coach him in sports? Uh, not really, um, which is probably a good thing. Um, okay. I want to know if you were a yeller. 
Yeah, no, not a yeller. No, I, I obviously helped teach him to ski, um, but no yelling. Um, yeah, yeah, intro west. You, they grew up there probably, right? They did. Uh, Anna, our older daughter, was eight when we moved to Whistler. Nellie was five. And uh, they, um, Nellie, <laughs> Nellie is an example. Uh, when we moved, she was in uh, just entering kindergarten. And the way kindergarten worked in Whistler is you went either to a morning session or an afternoon session. She went to the afternoon session, which meant that in the winter, Kate, my wife, could drop Nellie off at the Whistler gondola. Uh, at about 8.30 in the morning, she would ski all morning with a ski teacher and two of her classmates. And then when it was around noon or 12.30, they'd take the kids from ski school over to uh, the elementary school that she attended. Um, not a bad way to go through kindergarten. No, that is amazing. I, I, my, I'm trying to get my wife to consider moving to Puerto Rico right now because of the tax rate stuff. And we went out there for, I mean, I don't know if you know, it's a 4%. It's crazy. Oh, yeah. you, you don't pay any federal tax and Benzinga, we could move there and it's doable. And I'm like, well, how's the bad thing at four o'clock? You go to the beach, you in the sun, <laughs> there's a private school. There's a whole thing. I mean, like what you're talking about is kind of what I'm talking about, but on the opposite end, you know, warm weather oh. versus the skiing. But I'm, 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 I'm with you. Those experiences. Um, do they ski now? Or are they like, what, what do your kids do? They do. Um, they do ski now. In fact, Nellie, uh, Nellie and her husband both work for Google. And of course, Google's been allowing everybody to work remotely. They work for Google in New York. And um, they decided that uh, they would spend the winter on an extended ski road trip. So they left, left the Northeast on December 27th. And over the next, oh gosh, I guess it was almost three months, road trip through Big Sky and Ben slash Mount Bachelor, um, uh, Tahoe, Utah, Steamboat, uh, Santa Fe. They they lived right. They lived right. Yep. No, that's that's the best. And Google, talk about a powerful company. I mean, I have like I I, I invest in the company when I'm public, and I just won't sell a share. That is, I don't know what your kids do. You know, the husband and wife do for them, but that company is unbelievable. Unbelievable. Oh, Was it unbelievable. 50? The fifty billion of free cash flow in the most recent quarter. I mean, I I I, can't, I, I just remember getting out of college and and I almost went and worked for Google. Oh, that's a search engine it was my secret weapon to tell people like where things were. People didn't know about it at the time, and I was the one who'd always find things out. And so I used it and then tell people about Google. Ah, there's the search engine. Like there was Akamai. I mean, there was Infoseek, Alta Vista, Lycos. You know, Canoodle. There's a ten. Excite. Yeah. yeah, excite, excite, and then Google takes over the world. I mean, every tool is just like, I'm gonna Google it. I mean, I don't know, whatever they build, that's, if I had more time, I just wanna observe how they build stuff there because it's unbelievable. Yeah, right. yeah, so, there's a lot of smart, a yep. lot of smart people working for that company. Yep, so, all right, well, thank you for coming on, VICI. It's so amazing meeting you because, you know, when the Greek town deal happened, I mean, I'm, I'm in the same building as, as Gilbert, as Dan Gilbert. So that's where I, I'm, I know Dan pretty well. And so I remember that deal happening like it was yesterday. And um, and so, um, oh, we forgot about Ask Jeeves. Someone just put in there. Remember Ask Jeeves, that search engine? Oh, too? yeah, that's right. Yep, yeah, the, the butler. Right. Yeah, there you go. But yeah, you know, yeah, you, yeah. It, you do, you're doing, a, I mean, you're, it's an awesome company. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll keep following your career. And um, come on when you have some new news to uh, announce, like another Venetian deal, or when you guys get the the dome up. And this is this stuff's exciting. This stuff's exciting. So we'll it is. And, and, and Jason, if you allow me, one last parting comment um, for any of your uh, members who who are looking at our chart and going, "Ah, Vici's kind of run." Uh, the thing to keep in mind: if any of them are fond as I am of the old school metric, the price earnings growth ratio. Uh, we might be the cheapest REIT in America on a price earnings growth ratio basis. Uh, there's an analyst out of Union Gaming who pegged our peg um, uh, at uh, 0.6 to 1 on 2021, and I think 0.8 or 9 to 1 on 2022. Um, wow. We are wow. so cheap in relation to the growth we have embedded in our model. I, I personally don't think your full story is out there at no, all. No, no. You know, no. you know what I you know what I think you are, and I don't know if we have the graphic for it. Someone already wrote it in the chat. There's a thing that I talk about all the time on here 
let's see if it's here. I don't see the graphic. The thing, wait, where is it? The thing behind the thing. You're the thing behind the thing. You're yeah. making these things. And the thing behind the thing are is, uh, I don't know where my graphic is for that. They hide these graphics for me all the time. Anyways, the thing behind it, you're kind of the thing behind the thing for a lot of this stuff. And so you don't get. That, that is a great point. So Jason, the, the, the thing behind the thing, uh, I, I still have some money in Canada for my years there. And my Canadian investment advisor said to me a few years ago, you need to buy, we need to buy uh, this stock called Shopify. And I said, well, what the hell is Shopify? He should have said, it's the thing behind the thing. Did you buy it? Yes. I hate you. Yeah, I know. I know. I, you're entitled to. What uh, price did you buy it at? Yeah, it, uh, I th oh, you know what? I don't know. I, I think. All right, a long time ago. It's good. It's good. Yeah, it's like, I don't know what it is. Six, seven bagger. I don't know. It's, it's, it's yeah. insane. But to your, to your, to your member's point, I'm going to steal that one and tell, tell whoever put that up there. Uh, if they send me an email at epitoniac at vcproperties.com, I will thank them personally for the thing behind the thing, because that could be the new investment brand motto of Vici. Yes. Cause that's what we are. I, I coined it. It's my, how I invest. I have a big following. Oh. I, I always look for the thing behind the thing. When I So Twilio, HubSpot, all these different tools behind the thing. Amazon AWS, Benzinga, we're the, I bet you didn't know this. We're the largest news vendor in North America to the brokerage space. So if you count Ameritrade, Robinhood, Interactive Brokers, TradeStation, Lightspeed, Webull, I can name 15 others. Um, we're providing them news and data. You, Yahoo Finance, they're customers of us. They pay out their, we, we're like the associated press of the stock market. So we have 30 million people. So if we, our guys will write a story. If you open up Ameritrade, you're going to see VC all over it. So we're the yeah. thing, we're the thing behind the thing. And so we kept our website as the redheaded stepchild. It wasn't until 2019 that we started focusing on the website and then it took the business to another level. But, um, and so the thing behind the thing is what I always like to be. And people like say to me, why don't I want to be the thing? Cause I want to be the thing behind the thing. I, cause then everything else works off that. You get it? The widgets. So we provide, you know, you get it. All right. So that's your coin. You trademark. Have you trademarked that yet? I guess I should. Too late. Come I on, know. Jason. Christ Almighty! What well, are you doing? Maybe on your conference call, give Jason Raz like I'm talking myself in the third person a shout out or something. <laughs> thing behind the thing. Okay. <laughs> I will. Um, I'm, gonna get, I'm gonna get our lawyers on that today. All right. Now Good I'm gonna idea. know that because I have another company. We're late. All right. Um, oh All God, right. This guy's getting mad. All right. Good talking to you. Let's be in touch soon. Okay. I would enjoy that, Jason. All right. Thanks so much. All right. Bye Thank now. you. Thank you, guys. That was VI VICI sweet company. Uh, I went too long. I know I'm getting yelled at from the producers in the background, but we're going to go right to the next one, VICI. I don't own the stock yet, but I'll be a buyer, guaranteed. So if you want to join me, I'll be buying, but I have to with the next guest. So. Okay, wait, Aaron didn't do it. So, all right, uh, green, 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 oh, he just hit the wrong thing. Sorry, uh, Green Power, Frazier, how are you doing? Very good, thank you. I, I kind of feel like the comedian that's following a Robin Williams or a Bill Hader after your last guest. Yeah, and then and then after you, we have a, another guest, BitBoy Crypto. So you're going in between crypto. This guy, that guy was, you know, owns all the land for all the casinos. You're in Green Power. And this BitBoy Crypto is like the rage in crypto. So it's a full day. I went too long. I screwed up my watch. So now our producer guy's yelling at me because his bit boy's gonna get mad at me. And I hope he'll hang in for like a couple of like minutes. Aaron's freaking out at me, but um, hopefully they'll hang in. But no, uh, you, you have a sweet company too. I, I've been studying it, but I saw you laughing during some of the interviews. So I knew you were enjoying it. So I kept it going a little bit. Well, I love the comment about, uh, you know, we're, we're blowing smoke at customers because uh, we go out of our way not to blow smoke at customers. <laughs> I got it. That's a, that's a, I mean, you guys, but you guys, so how long you guys been around for? We've been around for over 10 years and uh, really the, the traction we've enjoyed has been in the last three to four years as we've focused around a uh, core platform that has given us a uh, number of passenger vehicles and vehicle and uh, delivery logistics and uh, cargo vehicles on what we call the EV star platform. Got it. Okay. And, 
did when you started this thing, did you guys think that this EV revolution and the electric, I mean, all this stuff would, would be happening now, or is it just Tesla be in the beginning and th this makes it go to another level? Well, like, when we started, it was literally before the first battery electric, uh, medium or heavy duty bus or truck had been sold in North America. So the total addressable market when we started was zero. And so I, I, certainly that's a nice base to start from in any business, but it's also daunting in terms of what the potential market could be. And so the early years in our space was uh, dictated by very, very high battery costs. I mean, when we first started, we're talking about north of $2,000 a kilowatt hour. And with batteries that didn't have high energy density and didn't have uh, much in the way of uh, the same reduction in weight we've enjoyed and so on. So you put together a vehicle that wasn't particularly uh, cost friendly or price friendly, and it could go down to the grocery store and back with three or four people. So, you know, that was the starting point. And from there, to answer your question, you know, you know I don't think anybody in North America uh, really could foresee you know when this would kick in although personally i thought it would kick in a year or two earlier than it ultimately did got it okay so you were so you were kind of like a first mover then and we that. were we were one of the early you know there was companies that started uh years several years before us and you know they didn't last because it just the market just wasn't there in the first four or five years yeah, you know, it's really just developed. But when I say it's developed, like last year, according to Bloomberg, the total medium and heavy duty battery electric bus, truck, van space, less than 3,600 vehicles in all of North America. It's still very early days for this wow. industry compared to the automotive. Wow, and that's what you guys specialize in? Like right now we're looking at um, examples. That's a 40 foot low floor transit. And we've got, actually we've got a, that's from a city in San Joaquin Valley, but we also have that operating with United Airlines at LAX. That's our cabin chassis, which uh, we just inked a deal with Forest, uh, Forest River, a Berkshire Hathaway company yep. that is one of the leaders with cutaways. So they're gonna put their body on our uh, vehicle, you know, our cabin okay. chassis. And that's Forest River. I've heard of Forest River. Okay. Um, and then that bus is that bus you or are you the battery in the bus? Like what was the? No, problem? it's it's our design. It's our uh, you know we manufacture it. It's uh, built up uh, from the ground up as a as a battery electric vehicle. That chassis you see there in the picture is our design. It's our build. And then we use best to breed components. Uh, such as, uh, you know, we could use NOR brakes, we use either TM4 or Siemens traction motors, we have multiple battery vendors uh, from around the world, and, you know, it's that combination that gives us the ability to deliver our own vehicle into the marketplace. Got it. All right, I must ask you, is this a huge boon for your company and stock? Schumer, uh, yes, I propose a $73 billion EV spending for transit buses. Would that be a benefit for green power? Absolutely. I mean, we've, Tell we've, me more. Tell me more. Well, so to give you context, over the past four or five years at conferences and panels, I've always talked about money and mandates. And now we're finding that, you know, it's really the mandates that are that are becoming the drivers of growth in our space. So companies, uh, you know, both corporations and governments are stepping up and saying, you know, we have fleets of vehicles and we need to electrify. And so Schumer's announcement and previously Biden's announcements, I mean, Biden, uh, when he was campaigning to, uh, uh, when he was running for president, he had on his website, the objective to electrify all 500,000 school buses by 2030. And right now there's, uh, there's less than a thousand uh, all electric school buses in operation in uh, North America. So that's to go from a thousand to 500,000 in you know, essentially eight years is a big, big number. Unbelievable, it's unbelievable for your company. That's unbelievable, that's, 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 so when do your earnings come up? That's like 
<laughs> do you just have earnings or when do your earnings come up? Well, we, it takes, you know, in the case of our largest vehicles, it takes well over a year to build a uh, you know, 40 foot low floor transit or a 45 foot double decker. Our EV star is the fastest vehicle we build at under six months. And so when we uplisted on NASDAQ last August, we undertook an increase in our production. Okay. So we're building various models of the EV star at the rate of 20 a month and 10 school buses a month. So those numbers start to hit our P&L in the case of the EV star this summer. And then the, in the case of school buses this summer and fall. Okay. So the, you know, the earnings to look forward to you know, are the September 30 and the December 31st of this year, you know, we'll be seeing some significant uh, upticks in not just the revenue, but in terms of the bottom line positive impact. Okay. Okay. That's, I mean, you're on my, you're on my watch list given the whole thing going on with the government and incentives. So this GP that we wanted to get you guys on because what's going on, like your stocks that aren't necessarily covered as much. So we would like you to come on again. I know we have a little bit shorter time because the last one went over a little bit. That's my fault. But can you come on again shortly when you have new stuff to announce, please? Well, we, we've got a lot of activity from mid-June through to through the summer. So uh, anytime, you know, in the next month or two months would be a, a really good opportunity to catch up. And I yep. think you'd see a lot of we're do, we're doing advancements in terms of what we're doing with our business. All right. Awesome. We're doing an energy week coming up in, in middle June. So that could be perfect for that. So thank you, Fraser, for coming on at Atkinson. Uh, Symbols GP, guys, take a look and uh, appreciate you coming on today. Oh, thanks for having us on. Thank you. Hello, hello, hello. I got an extra thing to do to move off. Okay, we're here, BitBoy Crypto. I'm sorry that we are a little late. I like the graphic behind you though. It is yeah. cool. Yeah, it's a, it's a glamour shot. Kind of like uh, Fraser had behind him. I don't know if anybody saw that. Yeah, I know, I know. It, it looks like <laughs> you. It's, it's, it's beautiful, it's beautiful. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so what up? What up, Crypto Man? How long you yeah. been playing the crypto game, my man? Well, I've been playing the crypto game since 2012. First got into Bitcoin. Uh, first Bitcoin I bought were uh, $12 each. And then uh, kind of the, the way how I got here is I, I sold them all very early. And then in 2017, realized I should have been worth eight figures and I wasn't. So, uh, you know, in January 2018, I decided to go all in on crypto and, um, you know, been making content ever since. And then this year, of course, with the prices and, and you know, the increase in the quality of our content, and the quantity, uh, you know, we've really exploded here and you know, kind of along the line with the prices. Yeah, it's like, it's like if you did a graph of you and the prices, it would be like sort of yeah. like, right? Like an S&P chart. I love that. Um, so, so do you, do you own right now a lot of Ethereum? Like what, like what do you, what do you own? Like what's your story? Yeah, so we own a lot of different stuff. Um, and I say we 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 have a company here. I've got thirty employees. We we just bought a thirty thousand square foot building. It's it's not just me making uh, videos in my mom's basement, um, like a lot of crypto people. But uh, we actually Ethereum is our number one holding outside of Bitcoin, uh, Cardano, Polkadot, Binance Coin. We have seven figures of uh, all of those, and uh, you know Bitcoin getting close to eight figures in Bitcoin alone. So um, it's it's been a wild ride this year. But we also have. A very very diverse portfolio. We have, uh, you know, probably about a hundred different coins that we own. Um, you know, going down the list all the way to the, you know, low two or three hundreds on Coin Market Cap. We've got some that are newer that are private sales. But kind of what we like to really talk about the most is the bigger coins, and the reason for that is there there's much less volatility in those compared to the ones further down the list. So you might be able to take, you know, a couple thousand dollars and put it into a very low cap coin and make a huge amount of money, but most likely you're going to lose. Uh, so we really like to stick on my channel to most of the things that we feel like to be pretty safe for people to, to make money with. So you can't really lose with Ethereum, Polkadot, Cardano, Binance, Elrond, Solana. Those are all projects that we love. Got it. Yeah, I have, I mean, hardcore. I have a, a couple guys here in Michigan who are hitting me up big time to get like, to like, you know, so we cover their coin. And yeah. I am like, are, is that an example of like that a coin that could pop? Like if I covered on the show, we we get like ten thousand to thirty thousand people a day watching the show. 
Um, and then we have 30 million readers a month. But if I cover it, then th that coin has a potential to really pop in the short term. Is that what happens? That's a complicated question because the answer to that question, unfortunately, is yes. And we go through that on our channel where, you know, we cover projects. We have some that are sponsored since the beginning of this channel. Uh, if we did a sponsored thing, we a hundred percent disclosure on everything we've ever done. Um, but we like to give the audience all the information. But the thing is, we have a channel as, as big as mine, like the awareness is there. And one of the things I'm really proud of is that when we cover different coins a lot of times people will obviously go buy them even if i say it's not financial advice even if i tell people like hey be careful everybody's going to go buy these tokens right now you don't want to buy it at the top you want to wait for a good entry but the thing that i'm really proud of is that if you ever go to coinmarketcap.com or coingecko whatever coins we cover on my channel are always the number one number two number three most researched coins so our people are actually like doing the research they're not just running to exchanges and buying them they're actually taking time to look at the numbers to look at everything um and that's what we try to push like we just want to educate people and give them the best ability to make informed decisions the, the other part of it though is crypto cyclical everything's going up right now we will go into a bear market at some point, most likely at the end of this year or next year. And so we also, like people have to understand like kind of time is, is of the essence right now to be making money with these coins. But like I said, the, the larger my channel grows, the the more we tend to stick to the top coins and the saver coins. But there's definitely a whole niche of, you know, super, we call them degen coins where you just throw money into them and make a bunch, but you also might get scammed, so. Yeah, I, I, I've heard uh, you know, people buying these coins in the short term and then eventually they went to zero. Um, yeah. I own a, I own a, I own Ethereum, mostly a little bit of Bitcoin, and then I own USDC. So USDC, I know is not is not like the the real stuff. But do you have any USDC? Yeah, of course. I mean, we we have USDC a lot of times. Being a channel as big as mine with the platform, we get the opportunity to get into a lot of private sales. And so usually the private sales or the seed rounds, we'll have to pay those with USDT or USDC. We we do prefer USDC over any other stable coin. So it is the real thing. Um, it's just, you know, it, it's a trading coin is really what those are. So, um, but I, I would like to ask you this question. I'm, I'm going to flip it. I, I like to interview too. Uh, yeah, yeah. How, how, how is your Ethereum doing compared to uh, your stonks portfolio? I mean, lately it's been doing amazing. I mean, yeah. It's, it's doing amazing. And I, and I, I, I mean, I'm not an expert on this stuff. Okay. But the reason mm -hmm. I bought, I bought, I don't know if it was 1500, but whenever um, the NFT was um, started up going crazy, and I have a friend that has this, um, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard of StockX, they do shoes and stuff. And so I was like, they should do NFT and whatever that I, I read yeah. about NFT and Ethereum powering it. I'm like, I need to own this thing. So that's why I bought Ethereum. Is that yeah. an accurate way to do it? I don't know. Yeah, sure. It would have been better if you bought it at a hundred bucks last year. <laughs> that's when we bought a lot of ours. It was doing it, 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 well it, it hit a hundred bucks last year. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah oh, in 2020, wow. in the March crash, um, it hovered around $200 forever. It seemed like for about a year, it hovered around $200. So you just got to really understand, wow. like, you know, the, the key to cryptocurrency, and I understand your audience is not probably a crypto specific audience, but there was a study done recently that showed that 64% of people in America right now are interested in cryptocurrency, at least, and an even higher number is interested in digital payments. Um, but a lot of people are very new. They don't understand all this works. The, the number one thing I would drive home to your audience that may not be necessarily extremely familiar with cryptocurrency is we have a thing called the Bitcoin cycle. It's a four year cycle so far right now. We're on the fourth one. All three of the first ones have behaved pretty much the exact same way. Bitcoin goes up for a year and a half and then it crashes hard for a year. Then it slowly goes up for another year and a half and then it goes parabolic for a year and a half. Um, and and that just kind of restarts the whole cycle again. So right now we are in what we consider to be the middle of this parabolic bull run we probably have. Um, I, I think by the end of September, we will start uh, climbing back down for Bitcoin by October to Thanksgiving. The rest of the coins will start going down and then it'll be brutal. So if you're going to invest in cryptocurrency, you have to understand how these Bitcoin cycles work because they've been like clockwork for the last 12 years. Wow. Wow. Okay. So then are you starting to sell them? Like, how do you handle this? Yeah. How do you know when to get out? My Ethereum, like I, I, yeah. I cut my USDC. I put a lot of my savings in USDC. Like a lot of my savings yeah, cool. are in USDC. Yeah. And I guess, are you, are you staking that on, uh, on BlockFi? So Maybe. I did it. I did it on BlockFi and TradeStation and Voyager. 
Well, there you go. So, yeah, that's the way you want to make money with that, um, with USDC and stable coins is, is staking it on, you know, larger sites and stuff like that. But um, the thing I would say about when you know is uh, generally probably about the end of the summer, you should start really thinking about pulling money out. Um, if, if As long as this goes on track with history, we pull money out from time to time. Like I mentioned in the beginning, we just bought a 30,000 square foot building for a huge studio. We're going to be doing workshops, all kinds of stuff. Kind of going to be the crypto capital of, uh, you know, the Atlanta area here. Uh, so that was a $3 million building. So we had to pull money out for that. So we pull money out to buy real world assets. Uh, we also have like a small stock portfolio and we've got other real estate investments that we made, but we aren't necessarily pulling money out right now uh, like just to pull it out. We think it's much more valuable still in crypto uh, for about the next four to five months, uh, maybe even through the end of the year at latest. But once summer hits, once the middle of summer starts heating up, we're definitely going to consider pulling out large amounts. And our goal is to pull out about 90% of our crypto portfolio. You wow. Know, by, by, the, by the top of the market. See, well, yeah, but you don't know if it's a top of the market, right? Well, kind of. I mean, we're not going to be able to judge it to the exact day or the exact moment, obviously. Um, but sometime within a range of 10%, one or the other, you know, we, we want to be within 10% at the top of the market. And, and we've got a lot of numbers to suggest we know where that is. Got it. Okay. That's awesome. Now, people in the chat keep writing. I mean, I get it in the chat, but also DMs ask me, ask him about Doge or Dodge, yeah. whatever you want to call it. Doge, Doge, Doge. Ask the bit boy. Ask the bit yeah. boy. So, what's your take on Doge? So Dogecoin, um, I bought uh, some of it, but about $10,000 worth when it was around a penny. And then I sold it at eight cents and felt like a genius. Um, so uh, then recently uh, I bought more at 36 cents. And now that's been a pretty good deal too. I look at Dogecoin as a stepping stone. It's not ever going to be the currency of the world. Right now it's hot because Elon Musk tweets about it and because the TikTok crowd loves it. I've got a huge following on TikTok. It's actually our, our biggest... A uh, number of followers is on TikTok. So we love 2.6 million. We're going to hit 2.7 very close. So got 2.7 million How there. Often do you post? Um, I try to do daily. Sometimes I go four or five days without posting, but um, any anywhere from one to three daily posts over there is what is what I like all, to do. All crypto related. Yeah. Now, so so I Trojan horsed them. So what I did in the beginning was is, I, and this was always kind of my plan. I I tried crypto content on TikTok. It didn't do well. So then what I did is I started doing like dark web stories. I was talking about like legends and monsters in America and it got really popular. I had a whole different brand called the CEO of Facts and I got up to about 2 million uh, followers there. And then I switched it all over to crypto. So <laughs> uh, we, we, we sucked them in and now they're getting the crypto content. So because crypto content in early or in late 2019 wasn't very hot, which was when I started the account. So yeah. um, but now we do all crypto all the time, pretty much over there. And so we, we love Dogecoin from the perspective of we love that people have made money with it, but it's not a world changing currency and it's not a decentralized platform. Uh, yep. You know, five years down the road, Dogecoin is going to be exactly what it is now. Whereas if you look at Ethereum, what it's developing into, if you look at Cardano, what it's developing into, you know, you, you see the bigger picture of where crypto and blockchain is going to. Dogecoin is fun. It's like the fun side of crypto. And so we, we support that. I definitely feel like it can hit a dollar um, in the the pretty near term, just based on all the hype. But at some point, it's got to hit a level, retrace, and then it might be a good time to get in. So Dogecoin is actually the first coin of this year that exceeded my price prediction. So hit it very early. So 25 cents was I, what I thought my price prediction uh, for this year was going to be for Dogecoin. And people thought that was crazy, and it just blew right past it. So. Yep. Yep. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Now your, your TikTok account is amazing. I have a friend, he starts up new TikTok accounts. He, he just does these, like you, if you pick a number one through 10, what, what color are you thinking? He literally can grow these accounts from zero to like 2 million, $1.5 million million followers. Yeah. I don't really create a brand off it. Cause he's not really like doing a product, but he's, I don't know. All these kids think he's like, he just lives right by down the street from me. And he has like, between his three accounts, like four million followers, wow. but he, he makes but he makes nothing with it, makes no money off it. Like he's not, I mean, so he doesn't know. So it's not as good of an account. So the question I have your YouTube, which I'm I'm on right now, is right here. Um, so these are big videos. How often do you do your YouTube clips? 
Oh yeah, we we do three videos every single day. So um, we do one scripted video or interview, and then we just move to two live streams a day. So we have a, a live stream in the morning that's kind of the, you know, this is what's happening in the world of crypto, and then we have a new show at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time every day, and that show is called Around the Blockchain, where we're bringing in other content creators, um, and we're giving perspective, a wider perspective. So people don't just get, you know, my opinion on what's happening every single day or, or anything like that. We want to bring in other ideas because I'm not right about everything. We like to say about 99.9% .9 of stuff. Okay. But everything, uh, everything man. Come yeah, on. yeah, everything. So um, that's what we like to do. And then on the weekends, we do more scripted videos. That's, that's Ellie you're looking at now. She's, um, she is an Australian model and she's gotten into cryptocurrency and we do a weekly show together where she tackles things from the beginner's perspective. And it's very interesting because she asks a lot of questions that the beginner would ask that like I wouldn't think about. So um, we, we just try to have kind of the most well-rounded channel in all of cryptocurrency and it's it's obviously paid off. Yeah, no, it's it's huge. What were you doing before all this? So actually before, I, I have been doing a kind of internet business for a, a long time in some form or fashion. It's how I got into Bitcoin. I used to sell concert and sports tickets. I had basically a white label website. Which one? It was called frontpagetickets.com. I worked right. with a company called Ticket Network. Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. I'm a, uh, so I know it all. Oh, I, had, well, there you go. I had Rate War was competing with StubHub. I almost bought out Ticket Network with two other two two other guys. Wow, interesting. Yeah, so yeah. I did that for a long time. I did really well. I was doing it all on Craigslist. I was going to ask you: Did you market when people posted tickets? Did you market links, buy the ticket here, and get all that? Did you? Do yeah, that? yeah. That's that's what I was doing on Craigslist. That's how I got into this because I was using an auto poster. At one time, when they used to have the renew feature and it, and it was free in the ticket section, I was doing 800,000 ads a day. Um, and that's how I got into in Bitcoin because Craigslist shut down the guy's payment processors because he was uh, foreign, didn't want to come here to you know uh, answer to a lawsuit. So I can shut his website down and his payment processors and um, had to... Uh, had to take Bitcoin very early on. So it's kind of how I got into this. But right before I was doing this, I was also, I used to, I was the executive director for a, um, a nonprofit uh, drug rehabilitation for teenage boys. So that's something I'm real passionate about is helping people change their lives. And so I've been doing that off and on uh, for about uh, about seven to eight years. Uh, so, you know, it kind of, I looked at that, it's, it's similar to what I'm doing now, I just really like to help people. And so, you know, we, we now we're helping people on a larger scale to change their financial lives, but, you know, helping people to straighten out their lives and deal with issues and, um, you know, be, be productive. That's stuff I'm really passionate about. Yeah. No, that, that stuff is, Oh, Brad Garlinghouse. I almost worked for Brad Garlinghouse and Chris Larson way back in wow. the day. I almost, for, I almost worked for Brad out of college. He had a company yeah. called Dialpad, but you're going to there and in, in the nonprofit, but I'm still stuck on the tickets. So you were, you had a thing, that you got from some guy to post 800,000 ads a day in basically every state. And so at one point you had 800,000 postings on Craigslist a day. Yeah. We, we calculated up between me and my brother was doing the same thing. We were like one to 2% of all Craigslist ads in the world based on their numbers on what they said. So did you um, stop that business? Yeah. So what happened is, is, uh, I had an auto posting software. It was called Clad G. Oh, maybe people have heard of it. That guy's got to be a billionaire because he was he was taking Bitcoin for years and years and years. Um, but we were we would run the auto posting software and it would go and it would post ads. Uh, I think we could get it to where it could post one ad a minute. And then I had uh, ten of them. And so basically, I was getting out. Um, 10 ads a minute, but then they used to have a renewal feature. So I had a different program built that would go in and every 48 hours you could renew the ad. And yep. basically it was just con like compound interest. Like over time, that number of ads would get so insane that we would have 800,000 all across the United States and Canada um, per day. And so it would just be like, hey, like, you know, uh, you know, Atlanta Braves tickets or, you know, Katy Perry tickets and people would click on the link on Craigslist. But what happened is, is that at some point, Craigslist changed overnight to $5 an ad in the tickets by dealer section. So obviously 800,000 ads a day wasn't an option. You didn't have to post as much, but over time, what happened is, is it just got to be much more competitive and you couldn't, you couldn't scale up or scale out everybody with it still being profitable. And so my income cut down uh, basically 90% overnight when they made that change. And then it dropped another 50% basically every single, uh, every single year for the next seven or eight years.
because more not, competitor, because more competitors entered the space. Yeah, and plus it just w I didn't have the same motivation to keep doing it when I wasn't making nearly as much money. So I started turning to other stuff, and I started you know wor working at the at the program I was working at, and then uh, also I was doing other side businesses. I website design, graphic design. I would do some of that stuff. Basically, any side hustle I could go to, uh, you know, make sure I was making a good income. So. Did you also do this, the same kind of hacky, scrappy stuff that I freaking love, fucking love, I'll say. You know, I've been doing, we have 130 people that work there, but like, like there's only very few people that do the scrappy stuff like you did with your auto poster. Yeah. Or, like I had an online textbook store. I was one of the first, I had one of the first oh, online wow. sites in the world in 2000. And then I had an online textbook store around that time too, which was one of the first ones. And we had airplanes fly over every like big football stadium back in 2000 we sold tons of textbooks um but my i guess my question is like did you do the same thing with your youtube your youtube like find a hat you know because like it looks like you know you got 100 000 views mm -hmm. 200 000 views 305 000 views i mean look at this you guys aren't checking out his youtube you're silly i mean come on well yeah but we go, go, go back a year and a half it'll be 300 views 400 views 500 views I'm you know i'm trying to go back a year and a half yeah, I, know, I, know. I make so many videos it's unbelievable how many videos i got um but yeah um well basically so no we don't use we do absolute zero like growth hacking on our youtube channel our youtube channel has been 100 percent organic um obviously having large other social accounts helps yeah. i have three uh, now i have three hundred thousand followers on twitter 160 000 on instagram 2.6 million on TikTok. so we have other large socials um, but a lot of those socials we've actually grown through the YouTube channel. TikTok was the one that was kind of on the outlier. We basically through TikTok we saw because we have such big numbers there about a tw about twenty five percent uh, extra uh, you know sub about twenty five percent of our subscribers when I'm doing a lot of TikTok content come from there. So it's still not the majority by any stretch of the imagination. I mean now you're getting into it. Now you're getting back. You saw one that three point yeah. six thousand. No, million. you're right. You're right. I'm not. It, it's yeah. It's a good story, man. It's showing six thousand, eight thousand. It's a good story. It's where you started. I mean, you're, you, it's like it's so cool to be, to be able to chronicle. I mean, look yeah. at that thirty three point five. You know, um, I mean, it's. Uh, I mean, I remember was selling tickets. See, I would buy tickets for Detroit, and I'd go on eBay and have the most attractive screenshot. You know, like the yeah. thing, so people would say it like lowest thing I had. I mean, you know what I did. And um, they would sell on eBay because it stick out. It's the same thing with YouTube in some respect. You know, you got to have yeah. the things. But 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 at the end of the day, people can fake the screenshots, right? At the end Absolutely. of the day, you have to have good content. You have to have yeah. good content. They have to want to well, talk. That's right? that's what we found is that you know what happened is it just kind of like, I mean, you know, it, it's it's hard to say because I know a lot of people are hurt by it. But the pandemic for me, like, really was. Um, there was a lot of things about it that helped my business a lot, you know, and, and one of those things was I made the commitment in January of last year that I was not going to go to any conferences at all. I was not going to do any traveling in 2020. I was literally going to sit at home and I was going to work 20 hours a day until we got it right. And until we changed things, because even in December of 2019, I was, I was getting, there was a video I did that has 300 views on it in, in December of 2019 right before I exploded. And so I decided like to just fully commit myself to making the best content and in, in, improving the quality. And then of course, as it turns out, like there were no conferences in 2020 anyway. So that kind of worked out in my favor. Um, so I didn't miss anything and I got to just put my head down and just grind and make content. And something happens when you make a lot of content, you get better at it. And so, you know, not only was I gaining all the knowledge of working 20 hours a day and, and, and being just fully immersed into crypto, but I was improving the quality. And so then about March, I brought on my first employee. Uh, it was actually my sister. We called her the assistant. Then she helped me edit my videos. And then we fast forward now to, a, you know, a year later, 14 months later, I've got over 30 employees and we're about to expand even more. We, we could have 50 or 60 employees here pretty easily, you know, if, if it wasn't for our restrictions on our building right now. But when we move into the new building. I mean, we, we think probably by this time next year, we'll have 100 to 200 employees. So so you're um, not you're not home. You're in a building right now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I have that. My I have a studio. We've got five five offices here. See upstairs of a building, and then our new one is absolutely phenomenal. So we're gonna we're gonna really do it big. We're gonna have like ten different studios. 
you got to when you do that, you got to like give us a walkthrough or do something. We'll, we'll do, let us interview. You. Absolutely. Um, well, we, we also have we also have another we have two other channels, one called New Money Gang, which is uh, kind of like flipping stuff, making money online, entrepreneurship. And then we also have Hit Network, which is our vlog channel that yep. actually follows what we do. So Hit Network, I know you were watching some of the videos on my BitBoy Crypto channel, the one that where we were in Miami, that's kind of the same style of that. So people get to see us building this business. It's not just, you know, all of a sudden one day we're huge. People got to see when we walked our building and looked at it for the first time before we even decided to buy it. So it really chronicles what we do. And, and we think it's good for people to see like, you know, you see me on camera, like I'm just a regular guy. You know, I got regular employees, regular people here. They're phenomenal, of course. Um, but we're just we're just a regular business, just like anybody else, just grinding and and trying to to do the best we can. Wait, hold on. I'm challenged. I can't, I don't see it. So hit a network. Hit. Hit network. H I T. Okay, hit. All right. Let's see. Okay, hit network. There you Just go. It. All yep. right. So now I see the I get to see the behind the scenes thing. Yep, that's all. That's all of our behind the scenes action, uh, Monday through Friday, and um, you know this channel is almost to a hundred thousand as well. So um, it's grow growing so, pretty quick. So a lot of these guys are in Atlanta, right? All these guys. I mean, we're we're a little bit north of Atlanta. We're actually in Ackworth, so we're about twenty minutes north of the city. But yeah, all of our employees are here in Ackworth. The last time I was in Atlanta was for a Final Four. Uh, NCAA. Oh, really? I'm a Michigan fan. Yeah. Oh, um, I was I was there, Michigan and Louisville. Yeah. Yeah, I was. I went to that. I love sports, man. I'm. Why I'm not like a regular crypto nerd. I you, love sports. Why didn't you say hi to me? That was rude. Uh, well, you know what? I was pulling for Louisville. So. Well, yeah, I was. No, I'm just right, kidding. I was actually pulling for Michigan. I'm not a I was fan. Sitting right next to the Fab Five that was there, Jawan Howard. They're all there. And yeah. You know, I was sitting like four seats away. We, one of my brother's college roommate, was high up there at Michigan. So. Oh really? Uh, yeah, it's one of those things. But uh, yeah. wait, so um, the, so, the, so that's sweet. And so the people you find in Atlanta are probably people that are already heard of you. Like, do you have to put up normal job ads, or do you have people that already heard of you? We we have a pretty good mix. Um, of course, at first nobody had heard of me, so I was just using Indeed. Um, so we still like we posted an Indeed job this week for uh, uh, somebody to help us with some in-house website stuff. But generally now we're to the size where like I just hired like a number two researcher, um, basically kind of like I have a personal assistant, but this will be like my research assistant. So we hired somebody on that one. Like we just asked people to send in resumes. We had 240 resumes in 24 hours. So we we're able to find the right person for that, um, you know, pretty quickly. So we're getting to the point now where we can just kind of say what we're looking for. And we have other people that like we have a guy that we just hired. He drove out here from Texas. He had a connection to somebody in our office and he just drove out here like just hoping to get here for free and intern and prove himself. And he's turned out to be phenomenal. And we hired him, you know, within a week. So that's, um, a, that's the best team members. I mean, yeah. what you're look, ultimately looking for is someone sort of like yourself that's driven and will hack away to make the things work and builds the next big, you know, big media network and explain crypto, educate people, teach them how to do this. You know how you know your pattern summer. You, you need people passionate like you. And Absolutely. I, and those freaking job sites like Indeed and uh, ZipRecruiter, you get a lot of noise. It's people that who work yeah. at like, well, I'm in Michigan, so we get General Motors, Ford. I literally say to people, you look great on your resume, but you're gonna hate our company because yeah. at our company, you gotta take something from nothing and make it into something and not have help. And like, and most people don't get that. They just wanna go, they wanna go through emotions in life. And I can't, yeah. and I'm like, I'm burnt out of people like that. I really am. I well, think it's it, it, it's hard to find people like that, though. You know, that's what I find. Like, you know, you you, you hire a lot of good employees and um, two of my employees just walked in. So I got to be careful what I say about them. Um, uh, but no, you hire you. You hire good employees and you get people to work out and do well. But, you know, there's only very few people in the world, I think, that really have that that thing in them that's just like, I won't quit. I will continue. I will be the best. I'll make this the best company. I'll make it the best environment for my employees. And it, it's hard to duplicate that. And the truth is, if you get too many people like that where you're at, then you then it almost doesn't work either, you know, because then everybody's grinding all the time. Everybody's trying to outdo everybody else. And then it becomes a big competition and which is good for some things. But, you know, you also need people that are just kind of direction takers and do what they're supposed to be doing. So I think you got to have a good mix of those people. But, you know, I, I think that we're, you know, my company is pretty special. We, we have a lot of special people here for sure. Yeah, no, exactly. You know, it, it, what you said is good. You, you know how to do this. I just love your scrappy nature, the Craigslist tickets, because I know the ticket network and there was a competitor 
and then StubHub and then Dan Gilbert who who did flash sheets. Like I'm, I was like, so StubHub was for sale for two, uh, 340 million. eBay ended up buying it for around that price. I was in the transaction to buy it before eBay with Dan oh, wow. Gilbert. I didn't have any money then. I went up to him <laughs> and said, you gotta buy this, it's gonna be a huge thing. And if you would have bought it, it would have made two billion. You know what I mean? Yep. Like, cause I was in the business like you were. And I'm like, right. this StubHub is the no brainer. But he didn't know me from Adam. I went up to him at a Tiger game. It was during the playoffs against the Yankees. Whenever the Tigers, well, you're not yep. gonna remember that, but yeah, that's I nice. remember I, back back when Verlander was or Pigeon. Yeah. Huh? yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went up to Dan. He didn't know who the heck I was. Dan owns the C Cavaliers and right. Yeah, Dan yeah. Owns Rock and I'm like, there's known a for a famous letter he wrote, I think. But anyways, yes, LeBron. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes. Yeah, good memory. Yeah. So I'm close yeah. to him, and that's how I met him trying to get by StubHub. That was, wow, that's amazing! What an amazing yeah. story! I know. Notice small world. We we're both into into tickets. That's really interesting. I know. That's why. That's why you're going to the you know your nonprofit, which I love as well. But I like I got to stay on the tickets because I was in the tickets. I yeah. love that you did it. You know, a different way. I did it because the Pistons used to be really good, and I would buy hundreds of tickets, and I'd get yeah. them for. I mean, they they have these ten dollar tickets for the Pistons, and you could sell them for three hundred a pop. Wow. It was crazy. Like it was in the playoffs for. It was just like printing money. Like it was like. It was crazy. I don't mean know. Those days, I mean, I got to find a way to live, right? You got to rub two bucks together and figure out the way. So, man, well, thanks for coming on. Like, yeah, absolutely. Said, thanks for coming on. Um, you're, you're awesome. BitBoy Crypto, follow him. He's awesome. He knows his crypto stuff. Um, I'm going to look at the summer months, and um, I'm going to watch you more. I'm going to watch the behind the scenes on the Hit Network. It looks awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me on. It's been, it's been a great chat. I mean, I love just getting on and chatting with people and, you know, exposing to new audiences and stuff like that. And, um, you know, to, to all of your audience, you know, thanks for watching for sure. Absolutely, man. Thank you so much and, and good luck and congrats to all the success. Thank you so much. All right. So guys, that was BitBoy, BitBoy Crypto. That was nice of him to stay on longer. He's a busy, man. He has tons of followers. I'm going to check out his TikTok account. Uh, and yeah, I kept them long. I know we have Get Technical on, and I guess we have Andrew Leff on with Get Technical. Aaron Rice, is that right? Uh, let's make sure. Aaron, is that right? Is uh, Andrew? Um, I got. I got to get with Spencer about that. He was the one coordinating with him, so I'm not sure. It was in the Slack. I didn't read. Okay, this is what I'm talking about. Bitboy Crypto, run through the finish line, guys. Like, come on, that's uh, Bitboy Crypto. Anyone can do what he's doing. You just got to run through the finish line. Those guys, like when he talks about team members and all that stuff. We can do it. I mean, I heard we're turning off our YouTube during the day now. I get all these complaints, but it's okay. I'm just hoping you guys figure it out. But thank you for the show. Hey, Benzinga Pro. Benzinga Pro, we have a special sale. You can get 30% off. Gets your price down from $99 to $79. And its price of Benzinga Pro is going up to $149 a month very soon. So get it while you can. Uh, go follow us on Twitter at Benzinga or on TikTok. We do have a TikTok account, Benzinga. We have a TikTok account. It's Benzinga. So go check it out. There's 50,000 followers. We love you. Um, and uh, Dakota, yeah, he's killing it. Just kidding. All those right. Are some, those are some great interviews today, Jason. It was unbelievable. I mean, um, unbelievable. Like, give me, give me CEOs like that all day. I will fucking be live. on. If you give me people like that every day, I will fucking be live on here all day. I will resign from Benzinga as a CEO, and I will interview them. Just be a full-time YouTuber? Because the, the VC CEO – I could have talked to him for 45, another 45 minutes. I had so much to say. So like, yeah, come Con Connor, take over my role and let me do this stuff. You know? Yeah. We need more likes. The link for the BZ discount. Uh, it's, um, um, I, I it's, oh. it's, it's right there. It's uh YouTube 20, YouTube 20. All right, guys. I love you. I hope you love me. If you have anyone that you know, you could refer to us for tech. Stick around for whatever. Andrew left on the business. What? I said, stick around. We're going to get Andrew left on the stream later. DM me on Twitter. If you know anyone, I still have my my um, my bounty site. My bounty site is up. Um, you know, uh, bounty site. You know, listen, NKL, Internet Forces, I keep trying to tell the guys. Yes, having big names is great, but it's not just that. It's discovery. It's People have to be alert about it. It's the scrappiness. Guys like Bad Boy um, Crypto posting to uh, Craigslist 800,000 times a day. It's the scrappiness. It's If I bring on Mark Cuban, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett today, yes, we'll get some more listeners, but it's not going to get the way you think it, it gets. It, it, there's more to this whole game, but I just haven't been able to spend the time that I fucking want to. That's the truth. Sorry for my language, Aria. That was inappropriate. And sorry for the babysitter. I just shouldn't have sworn like that. But... Um, 
you know, um, so yeah, that's what I would say. I, I and, and Kel, I'm with you. I'm with you on those. Um, I'm with you. So let's do it together. Let's make it happen. Zinger Nation. What is my bounty site? That's what I want to say. What WW um, um, Trader Tool Trader Tools Trader Bounties Trader Tool Bounties Trader Tool Bounties. That's what it is. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. Much love. Give Give Aaron some love. He's um, trying to make it. Um, you know, make it happen. All right. Yes, sir. We're gonna go transition over to get technical. Peace out, lovers. <laughs>